The common good is a phrase around which there has been quite a bit of grouping, particularly by Christians who have been taking it up and using it as a focus for an approach to contemporary politics that is at once bipartisan and nevertheless marked by certain key principles. And I want to discuss what this phrase can give us, uh, whether it is, in fact, the way into some kind of uh, concerted political program, a question to which I shall answer, of course, yes and no, uh, or to be more precise, no and yes. To speak of the common good is to make a conceptual proposal for how life in community may be envisaged. A proposal that is for our thought about society. Philosophy and theology both know of other goods, goods of the spirit attained only in solitude goods that lie hidden behind all concrete and social goods, goods, in fact, that are not common. It's only in clarifying the nature of human community that the epithet common comes to direct our thinking about the good. And those who appeal to the common good do so in the hope of refreshing the political imagination and especially in our times, of overcoming a sterile opposition between two rival political imaginations that have dominated the modern West. On the one hand, the attempt to derive political forms from the private aspirations of discrete individuals, the vision of political life as a contract. On the other hand, the counter-attempt to cast political community as a matrix within which all individual goods are conceived. <coughs> Either the collective is derived from the individual or the individual is derived from the collective. But if we suppose that this opposition is mistaken at heart and learn to conceive that each participant in society has a fundamental interest in the commonality, and the commonality has a fundamental interest in its participants, then the term common acquires a distinctive meaning. Faith in the common good, write John Milbank and Adrian Pabst, promotes the plural search for shared ends. And the word common is here taken to mean something like communicated. That is, reflectively and intentionally held as common by the participants who value it precisely for the reason that it is held as common. Well, such is the proposal of the common good in brief. How far does it take us in political judgments, in identifying policy priorities, or in preference for certain forms of institution over others? Not very far, apparently. The idea of the common good cannot give an answer to the question as to whether a wider distribution of monetary income is more urgent than a wider distribution of health care, whether common security is more important than free movement of individuals, and so on and so on. What it offers us, rather, is an imaginative framework within which these policies may be advocated. Neither can it determine which form or level of community has greater authority than other levels. It cannot assert the right of the nation state over the international community, for example, or of the international community over the nation state. It cannot assert the right of voluntary communities over natural communities or of natural communities over political communities. 
or of local communities over regional and national communities and so on and so on and so on. There are many common goods and as many communities as there are goods communicated. Legal communities, natural communities, elite communities, universal communities, universities, jurisdictions, businesses, markets, families, churches, and so on. And any one person must inevitably engage in many of these communities, and to each of them belongs the claim of the common good on its own ground. And discerning a hierarchy of authority among them cannot be done simply by referring to the common good. A great deal of the work of political deliberation, in other words, lies downstream from that source. Nevertheless, to say that the idea does not take us very far in shaping political policy does not mean that it takes us nowhere at all. We may make three general observations about how this idea shapes political discourse before proceeding to identify some more specific emphases. In the first place, it offers us a critique of the self-destructive courses into which false political imaginations can lead us. When a political debate that ought to be about identities and loyalties degenerates into an exchange of economic predictions about how well off each citizen will be on one or another scenario, or when some urgent security crisis prompts cruel acts of repression to preserve the security of the state, or when political institutions lapse, as throughout the Western world they tend to, into a meaningless tug of war between so-called left and so-called right, words that communicate nothing and are, of course, meant to communicate nothing, the idea of the common good serves as a call to renew an impoverished imagination, which cannot do politics because it hasn't the first idea what politics are about. What we do today in happy commemoration of Duncan Forrester is, first of all, to register a critique, which I think would be dear to his heart. A critique of a politics that cannot imagine effective community and is therefore incapable of understanding, let alone addressing, the questions and the challenges that face it. In the second place, the idea of the common good invites us to look with new and more appreciative eyes at forms of social communication which actually work well. Not only in formal political institutions, but in social contexts that usually lie below the political radar. It tells us that the communication of goods is a permanent dimension of human existence. It warns us that if we fail to see how this is so, we shall plunge into distracting and possibly destructive reinventions of ourselves. We shall regenerate political thinking most effectively if we reflect upon the complex modes of human communication and privilege those patterns of giving and receiving which evidently meet the needs and satisfy those who participate in them and therefore contribute to forming community. So the idea of the common good is not only critical, but also, in one respect, conservative. It reminds us of the duty to be observant of human life before we rush in with our prescriptions for it, and to think a posteriori from lived experience of community rather than deductively and thus schematically and abstractly from above. In the third place, the idea of the common good brings into question the boundaries that define the communications in which we engage. Now, boundaries are necessary for politics. No decisions can be reached or implemented if it is not quite clear on whose behalf they are being made. Yet lines of frontier demarcation are historically conditioned and provisional. France, Great Britain, Europe, 
Scotland, these are not the names of eternal realities. Every political structure, however successful in its day, must either evolve in response to new challenges or decay into impotence. And the idea of the common good requires us to extend our imaginations outwards from the community in which we find ourselves in order to engage in communications across its frontiers. I prefer the language of extension to the much more fashionable language of inclusion. For the correct image is not that one community, Scotland, Europe, Great Britain as it may be, can somehow include or wrap the rest of the world into itself. That is a totalitarian notion. Rather, it broadens the scope of its communications to encounter what comes to meet it from across its imagined or defined frontiers. The idea of the common good has a perennially challenging universalism about it, reminding us that even in the case of communities, the concrete has no light of its own to live by, but depends on the universal to give it moral significance. From these three general observations, we can add more specificity. Although the idea of the common good does not dictate policy preferences, political policies like political institutions belong to their time and place. They must change following changing demands. What it does is to shape the imagination from which these policies are developed. And in encouraging us to take the given forms of human community and their satisfaction seriously, it can point to certain paradigms of social flourishing which embody preeminently the coincidence of individual fulfillment and collective benefit. Let me identify three of these paradigms. First, there is the good of work, on which Milbank and Pabst comments that it shows us the personal origin of all human society and culture. And that's a very shrewd insight, I think, into the nature of work. While at the same time, they say, its free expression of personhood requires learning from the past and sympathetic cooperation with fellow workers and clients. Now, much is said about the need to reclaim economic thinking from the narrow perspectives of finance and reintroduce it to the realities of the lived economy. The place of work is perhaps the primary test of how far it is possible to do, do this. A traditional economics categorized work as a negative value, an expenditure required to achieve a flowback. But now, and for the foreseeable future, we face a famine of work. We continue to plan by enthusiastic research in artificial intelligence and in other ways for a world in which as few people as possible will have any work to do. But the wise man said there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work. So we're planning for a world in which as few people as possible will have this good than which there is nothing better. Cool. Our work shapes our world. It gives us room for satisfaction in accomplishment. Uh, and the converse is also true. The unhappiness that attends lack of work or the failure of work strikes very deep at our self-assessment and self-confidence. So I think we're likely to reap a bitter harvest from investing all our energies in putting people out of work. We have to learn to re-envisage work as a form of social and personal fulfillment. All work, not just the privileged elite work that uh, retired scholars like to do. Uh, a satisfaction of agency and a form in which wisdom can be and is transmitted. In the second place, there is the good of the home. And I use that term with deliberate width to mean the community in which competent agency is acquired. A sphere presupposed by any politics, since practical endeavor, including political endeavor, requires more than physical existence as its condition. <clears throat> ben Sirach wrote that God exalted our days from the womb and dealt with us according to his mercy. 
The elevation from the womb that we require is a cultural elevation, which we think of today in two phases, once less distinct than they are now, an emotional elevation secured by the family and an intellectual elevation secured by the educational institution. And in dealing with this sphere, the political endeavor has to recognize something on which it needs to count as a prior condition for its own possibility and maintain a careful balance, avoiding a disinterest that never troubles to understand or protect the terms on which family and education work well, and avoiding the kind of systematic interventionism that distorts a process that needs, above all, to be allowed and welcomed and received rather than made to occur. If, broadly speaking, the politics of late modernity has erred towards disinterest in the family and excessive intervention in education, we can no doubt point to examples of the opposite mistakes, uh, one not a mile from here. The essence of the matter either way is that this sphere of common life and its necessary freedoms are simply not understood. And that is because the maturing of the young human agent is not understood either. So that it's difficult to argue that the natural family and the school are goods in themselves, not simply services to the economic or political project. I need only note the embarrassing fact that responsibility for the care of the universities in Great Britain has been assumed through the Department of Business, Innovations and Skills. In the third place, concern for the common good must prompt concern with international justice. Once again, it's necessary to distinguish this thought from any claim for particular institutions, the United Nations, international law, whatever. Institutions, even international ones, are concrete, limited, and therefore to some degree blind. International law, the development of which has been, to my mind, one of the most welcome achievements of the 20th century, is certainly capable of its own deep blindness. The pursuit of the common good does not require us uh, to respect one international institution or set of institutions over all others, but to make sure that the search for a more competent and less blind international institution goes on and responds to shifting and changing international demands. To conceive the international realm as a kind of government par excellence is the worst of mistakes. Those who developed Western institutionalism out of the twin legacies of Roman jurisprudence and Christian theology understood very well that the key to its success was not inventiveness of new institutions, but discovery of overlooked resources a hidden treasure, a unifying tradition of political practice that ran beyond the frontiers of every political entity, half rooted in nature, half in custom. The so-called jus gentium, the law of nations, had to be unpacked, explored, and developed. Within that tradition, each nation could expect to find its own best practices and highest expectations reflected back to it by its international context. And this is the point, finally, to refer to two current challenges, which, though different in kind, both require of us a clearer sense of how a common good could be located and described within the continent of Europe to which we belong. One is the influx of vast numbers of refugees from the war-torn Middle East and the unstable lands of North Africa. The other is the imminent withdrawal of Great Britain from membership of the European Union. Now, in neither of these cases does the idea of the common good deliver us a policy to be followed. It cannot tell us in the first case that we should accept more or all refugees or that we should defend the viability of existing communications against the threat of being overwhelmed by the massive numbers of refugees who are pressing on them. But what it can do 
is to focus our attention on the question that any policy for refugees must address. How may real and functioning communications be extended to engage with those whose urgent presence at our borders cannot simply be wished away? We may at least say that two possible policies, those of the fortress Europe on the one hand and those of the Europe sans frontières, on the other hand, are excluded, since each is a way of refusing the challenge to build communications between migrating and settled populations. And that is the way we have to address the whole problem. The search for new communications is at the same time a search for new institutions to serve them, and institutions require their own definition, which means to say their own borders. The idea of the common good cannot tell us what kind of institutions will be most serviceable to this need, but it can tell us that when existing institutions are manifestly failing to meet the challenge, then we have to search for improvements. And as with the first example, so with the second. The decision the British people took is very easy to regret with loud cries of lamentation not least in view of the inadequate way in which it was reached. Yet, we cannot look to the idea of the common good either to condemn it or to endorse it. The decision about which institutions can best serve the common good of Britain and its European neighbors is not to be settled a priori. What the idea of the common good does do is to focus attention precisely on the important point. Not whether Britain shall pursue a good in common with its European neighbors, but how best it may do so. Which rules out, I think, some attitudes that were plentifully evident in that unfortunate camp referendum campaign. The notion of a purely economic commercial relation, for example, with no implications for any other types of good held in common. It's possible to say that the institutions of the European Union and parallel institutions are best fitted for the task of economic regulation and have not served other communications well. But it's not possible to say that one can view neighbors solely as customers or vendors. And as a theologian with interests in philosophy, I cannot ignore the fact, for example, that when British philosophers are left to think by themselves. Uh, you will, uh, any here will no doubt excuse me this highly prejudicial remark. Uh, um, their thought increasingly resembles that of desiccated calculating machines, and that even in the present generation, the near desert of English-speaking philosophy has been made richly fruitful by rainfall from the cloudy skies of Europe. Our sense of relationship has to embrace all this. So we must ask afresh what institutions are needed. Having peremptorily rejected institutions that were in place, the British people bear a special responsibility for seeking to discover new and more serviceable ones. And if the outcome of the decision made last year were to focus attention in this country more sharply on building up neighborly relations across the channel, that would be a demonstration, though a paradoxical one, of the perennial attraction of the common good. Yet, for such a newly focused concern to bear fruit, Britain's interests in its neighbors would need to be met not merely with reciprocity, but with a measure of charitable forgiveness, too. I shall stop at that point. Thank you.